Welcome to Apostolic Archive. We have gathered many wonderful sermons through the years and we have decided to share them with the world. We hope you enjoy. Please subscribe to our channel. Please like the video and comment with something you take away from this message. Also, hit the bell below so you can receive an update as soon as we upload new content. Blessings. Be here and to be with you and to see every one of you this morning in this session. And uh, why don't we pray and ask God to bless us? Because uh, we have come from, from some very spiritual meetings last night and this morning. And so, so what we do in here is shift gears. That's what I'm going to do. If you're still looking for it to be hot and heavy like it was over there, you're going to have to go back over there because, or go to some other class because it's a little different. And so we shift gears and uh, come into a teaching session in this way. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll get hot and heavy. I don't know. But uh, we'll see where we're at. But let's ask God to bless us, shall we? Everybody, praise God. Lord, I love you today. And we ask your blessing, your strength, your help, your anointing. Come down with glory and power. Come down with the unction of the Lord today. Hallelujah. Bless us, I pray. Bless us in this class. Bless each one that's here. And we thank you for every church represented. In the name of Jesus Christ, give us just exactly what we need. In the name of the Lord, and everyone said amen. amen. Shake hands with four people before you're seated and smile, will you? Hallelujah. Let me shake Well, it's good to be here. Can you say praise the Lord? This is the first time I've been in this, this uh, ta old tabernacle. Uh, where'd that come from? Was I, have, do I have a little competition? <laughs> but uh, I'm just kind of trying to get used to this just a little bit. We did this to our old church building, made a gymnasium out of it. When I left here uh, 22 and a half years ago, this district... Uh, this was the main tabernacle, and uh, so, but it's good to be here today, and uh, we are talking about organizing effectively our Sunday school. What does that little deal say? Does that say that? Or is the word effective on my next one? It's on this one? Oh, I better do that job then, hadn't I? All right. Or, no, organize your Sunday school. The next one, I got the word effective in there. So, but it ought to be effective anyway. I think Sunday school is one of the greatest arms of the church. It does not have the prestige. We just well be frank, look at it like it is. It does not have the prestige that it has at one time. We used to preach, um, oh, 20 years ago, um, I preached across the country a number of bus ministry rallies, and uh, they were great rallies. Had we we would just that's all it was was just bus ministry. Sunday school was number one, and it may be in your church, uh, but in most churches Sunday school is not number one anymore. Uh, I don't know just when all of this happened, but the heyday of the Sunday school and the United Pentecostal Church, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, into the 80s, but it seemed like that it's not like what it used to be. And we have so many other ministries. I know in our own church we have, we have what we call a touch ministry, uh, which is an outreach ministry. We also have care ministries, and, um, which are small groups. And there's just a lot of things that we are doing today that uh, may be taking somewhat away from it. I don't know exactly what happened. I have my ideas, but this is not the place to uh, uh, air them or to even give you my idea. But I do believe in organizing Sunday school. Organization is the greatest thing in the world. I drove from West Monroe, Louisiana to Lufkin, Texas yesterday in a very organized situation. Uh, it, everything was put together in a factory in Germany uh, for me to be able to come here yesterday. 
and uh, it uh, had wheels on it. It had a steering wheel for me, had an engine that was kicking over, had gasoline in the tank after I paid the fella for it. It, um, uh, there, was just, there was a comfortable seat to set in. I punched a button and air conditioning came on and I pressed a tape and it went into a deck and, and I listened to uh, one, of the, one of my most interesting preachers all the way over here. I listened to me. <laughs> I, I was seeing about a, a couple of sermons that uh, I want to transcribe and put down uh, in, a, in another direction. I wanted to see what was in them. I hadn't heard them in a while, and I preached them in another part of the country. So I listened, and hey, guess what? I got inspired. Hallelujah. I got all set up. That's right, just for this meeting. But coming along in that organized vehicle, didn't cover much space, but you know what that did? It got me all the way from Louisiana to Texas and to this meeting. And that's what organization does. I believe in organization. And I have always done that. I believed in it. Um, my home that I grew up in was a very organized home by two disciplinarians. I left that home soon after my 16th birthday, went in Uncle Sam's Navy, Spent over three years there in World War II, and uh, that was a very organized place. They taught me discipline to put things together. They told me when to get up, when to go to bed. They told me varied things. Uh, and so organization is something that is very, very vital. I have pastored in uh, Tupelo, Mississippi, Shannon, Mississippi, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Orange, Texas. I was president and founding president of Texas Bible College, spent six and a half terms there, and a pastor in West Monroe now for 22 and a half years. And in every one of those places, we organized. And because we organized, and I'm not boasting on myself, I'm giving you some facts here today that because we organized and we worked our organization, we planned our work, as the old saying goes, and then we worked our plan. Things happened for us. And uh, in the Cedar Grove Church, in just in a short time, we started that under a brush arbor. We built a building in a short time. We were averaging 130 to 150 with a high before we left there after a couple of years is all with, of 220. And in Shannon, we took a little two-year-old church and was running between 80 and 100 in it. We only stayed there a year. I was young, rambunctious, and got around somewhat. We went to Albuquerque and started that church. And uh, from scratch in our front room, we ran about 70. It was a little more difficult there. We had a little tougher time. But uh, after four years, we had about a 70 uh, average and then we went to Orange, Texas, and uh, uh, we averaged the last year there 255 with a high of 400 plus. I don't remember just what it was. And then when we started Texas Bible College, we started it from scratch. I'm talking about what you can do if you organize and put it together and work your plan, get people trained and put them together in a organized fashion. Uh, we started that with 54 students the first year. Actually, my wife and I started in the den in the Orange Church at our home there in the den. And uh, then we went into the most crude type of situation to begin the school because things hadn't worked out like we had thought as a district it was going to work. Very crude fashion, 54 students. And then the last three years were there, we had 400 plus students. Um, and I know there were a lot of helping hands in it, but I'm talking about what organization will do. I remember as a boy on the farm and how my dad hitched two horses together or two mules together to a plow, to a wagon or whatever he wanted to move. And by hitching all of that together, we were able to move things. I was just a boy back then, but I remembered the lesson of getting that together. 
feeding those animals, giving them a good night's rest. Before the sun came up, they were back in the harness again. And things were happening. We were able to eat, and we ate well during the Depression. So all that I'm saying today is that organization works. Organization works. It's worked in the church where we are now. God has, has blessed it in a very tremendous way, and I thank God for it. But it could not be done if it was done in a haphazard thrown together way and was not planned day in, day out, and things being done by harnessing together the energies of people and ideas and plans. It hasn't been all my idea and my plan. Back at Texas Bible College, one of the greatest things that helped us then were, were great preachers in the air that came in and taught in the beginning, and it attracted people from all the country. And so, it, and, and then the district board, Brother Gidrose was the superintendent at that time, and so many wonderful people. And so I'm not bragging on myself, I'm bragging on what organization will do and putting together choice trained people that can do the job. And so I haven't come to you today so much with just how, we're, how to put together a Sunday school. Most of you know you ought, to have, uh, you ought to have a nursery and you ought to have a kindergarten and you ought to have uh, uh, beginners and primaries and juniors and, and uh, some of you may call them just a little different there. And you have a junior high and high school and you have college and career and you have young adults and you have, you have adults. Or if you're in a small church, when we started the church in Albuquerque, my wife taught the children, I taught the adults and youth. We had two classes. It was organized, and it fit the bill until we grew and we trained some people, and we were able to get have more classes. And when we started under that brush arbor in Tupelo at the Cedar Grove Church there, which is a very fine church today, the same building we built, and but it was it was a. It was a great thing to see it expand, but we started small, very, very small in all of these areas, every one of them, every church thinking back about it and how that we went. We only have 20 classes in our church now, but we believe in big church, big classes that are center of interest with a large staff. We have a superintendent over every class with with staff members, uh, it's according to which area they're in. In the children's classes, we'll have up to five or six in, on the staff in that. We have 11 children's classes, five youth uh, classes, that's 12-year-olds through college career. We have four adult classes. But in, in a small church, you put those together, you use the same formula. In organization, you use the same formula, the same formula that you use to put together, what is the smallest car going now? I don't know. Um, I heard this Geo, is that, that's a good little car, but it's a, it's a small little car. Or what is the biggest thing going, the most expensive thing going? But the same formula is used to get the very same thing done. You see the idea? The idea in organization is to use the same basic structure and fill it out as the need arises. This is what you do in organization. There's all kinds of books that tells you how to put a, a uh, Sunday school together. But there are some things that I, would, I, I want us to mention today. I think that basically in, in organizing a Sunday school and putting it together, one of the greatest things is to have leadership training. Leadership training. We have what I have, a, what I call a pastor's leadership group, care groups, because we're in the care groups. But I have this special one for all leaders. It doesn't matter who it is, superintendents in Sunday school or the youth director or the choir director, or whoever, whoever's in leadership, 
There are leadership principles, and they ought to be pulled together. Now, here's what we're implementing. We're start, we're, and and uh, it's like Brother Brent jo Brett Jones said today, you're constantly within Sunday school, there's a constant change in organization as new things come, new ideas, something works for a while. Don't be afraid to throw it aside and start something else. Now, we're talking about methods. We're talking about methods and organization. Uh, it's just like this Saturday school, uh, what do you call it? Saturday morning high? Live. S Saturday morning live. We have, our youth are called Youth Alive. S but uh, Saturday morning live, what a beautiful idea. That's a tremendous thing. Now that's going to help, that's going to revamp your Sunday school a little bit, you do that. There'll be some little changes done there. There'll be people that uh, that won't teach the Sunday school that'll be there, uh, that uh, don't, that will not feel the burden. It's like we've start. we have 11 sessions on Wednesday night. We don't have a general meeting anymore of everybody coming together for a service and general Bible study. We have 11 sessions. We have four children's areas going. Well, some of the people that take leadership in those areas have had to resign their Sunday school class or superintendent or a teacher or whatever they were there because they want to put all their eggs in one basket and they feel like they felt like they were spreading themselves a little thin. Anything you add to your organization, remember, it's going to upset the rest of it a little bit. And you've got to be ready for that as you expand into some of these areas. But uh, it's a very beautiful thing. It's like our church had to get used to me not teaching the sanctuary class on Sunday morning. I teach a, a middle adult class. I, I felt like that's where I was needed. And it, I may change to the young married, the youngest married ones. I may change into that to give it a boost, to give it some inspiration, to so, show the importance. You got to roll with your punch in that you get, and be and be ready for any type of change. Let me tell you, if you grow, if your Sunday school grows, and if you grow as a person, you've got to change. You've got to change. I don't pastor like I did 20 years ago. Our church is not the same church it was 20 years ago. It can't be. I don't drive the same automobile I drove 20 years ago. We, we're not in the same building we were in 20 years ago. And so it is with methods. There's got to be some change made. You, you have to do that. In any, in, I was in athletics before I came to God, and there were, you paced yourself, and there was some changes. You had to, the, even in any type of athletic contest, you run into problems. You, they run into problems that they didn't anticipate. And so they have to regroup. That's the reason they take timeouts. So that they can figure out what they're going to do. And so we do that as far as life is concerned. You do that raising a family. You've got to think that way in Sunday school. You just can't do it like you used to do it. You can't. You've got to be willing to change with the time. See, it distressed me when Sunday school, because it's, that's always been a top priority with me. And it distressed me when I saw a lesser emphasis upon it. But it's not only United Pentecostal Church, it's most in any church. It's, it's what's happening to our world, and there's different other things that are happening. So this is why we went to care groups and other things. They, they did, we didn't quit our Sunday school. We re-emphasize Sunday school, but it's helping us in some other areas. So, uh, we, here's what we're doing. At 9 o'clock, our Sunday school begins at 9.45. At 9 o'clock, we're having what we call our care groups, Sunday school care groups. And the superintendent over a class meets with the staff at that particular time for prayer, and they're going to meet for about 20 to 25 minutes. 
because they're supposed to have those classes open by 20 or 25 after for people to start coming and have the pre-session and this type of thing. These are going to be planning session times. We want about half of it to be prayer, praying together, and about half of it a good organized uh, bit or bite of planning session. And that adds something to it. If, if, now in a small, small Sunday school, then you get the whole staff together for prayer, for burden, for some planning. It, it's very beautiful. The thing that makes the bus ministry work is to hit it every week with something. Every week. But sometimes we, we, we throw a Sunday school together and never have a meeting. Never get together. Organize these things into it. And they are very beautiful. In, in the middle-sized church, you can get together by departments. It's according, maybe you're from a Sunday school, maybe you're the only teacher. I don't know. Or you, you just have classes with teachers over them. I don't recommend that. I think there ought to be at least two people in every class, two adults. That's a check and a balance on what that teacher is even teaching. I think it's, a, it's good for someone else to hear somebody teach. And, it, and that teacher knows there's another adult ear that's going to hear what they're going to say. I think that's a check and a balance. It's either going to be good or it's bad. Or, and, uh, and, and after a while, uh, I, you, you, will, you will know. That's very good. Okay. Now, I said all of those things to get to this. Great Sunday schools do not just happen. And let me, I, I didn't say big Sunday schools. I said great Sunday schools. Now, I think this. I, I, I don't think some of our best Sunday schools are the biggest Sunday schools. I, I, they, the, some of the biggest Sunday schools may not be doing in those Sunday schools what they ought to be doing. They may have a great bus ministry that's bringing a lot of children in and people. They may have tremendous outreach that's bringing people in. But they may not be teaching and affecting as well as a smaller Sunday school. Now, they could be. They could be. So uh, I, I want you to understand that I believe this. Your Sunday school may not be the biggest, but it can be the best. The best. And I think this should be our goal. We should have the goal to be the best we can be. I don't care who we are, what we're doing, whether it's mowing the grass or scrubbing the car or washing the dishes or teaching a Sunday school class or pastoring a church or superintending a Sunday school. We ought to put our best into it. We ought to be the best. Great Sunday schools do not just happen. Just like a tree does not appear overnight, so a Sunday school does not either. The tree takes time mixed with the proper ingredients of water, sun, and the lack of harm to develop its potential. I was reading in the room about uh, temple industries out here at, at Dybal, and I, maybe the headquarters are here in Lufkin. I don't know just how it is but how they preserve the forest. And I'm from a forest area. One side of the river, all the way to Mississippi for 75 miles is some of the greatest delta, uh, Mississippi Delta land for farming. But over on our side, the West Monroe side of that Washtenaw River, it's hills and trees and forests. So I was interested in that. And how tree develops and how you preserve it. And so it is with a Sunday school with the same type of preservative idea and attitude, you approach your Sunday school. The Sunday school must have that same kind of care for it to, for it to achieve its ambitions. Now, there are four steps that I'd like for us to mention here today in this particular session. And I think they are vital, very vital. You think of your Sunday school and how, how, how that it is organized and how it is put together and what you want to do for it. And I think these four steps have something that are very vital. It will become the best 
with these four steps in building a great Sunday school. Number one, there must be goals set. Where do you want to go? That is, with your teaching, with the training of your staff, with your number. What kind of teaching do you want? How do you want those kids as they come from one step to another through your Sunday school? And we have superintendents and teachers that stepped all the way through our, they, they grew up in our church and through the Sunday school. Now they're superintendents and teachers. What do you want them to become and know? And then what about your staff? Set some goals in training that staff. Bring someone in. Billy Lambert's just waiting to come to your church. Hallelujah. That's right. Amen. She may have put you on three years from now, but, but someone, there's some other people like her. There's other people from other churches. We have people from our church that goes to other churches to, to take care of things like that. There, there, there are just people that are ready to go help and put together and inspire and encourage in that way. Training your staff is highly vital and important. That those people know what they're doing when they get there. Hallelujah. It's important. Yes, sir. Okay, number three is what number do you want there? This is setting goals now. What number do you, would you like? And see, you set that as goals throughout, the, I'm, what I'm talking about is you put this, these goals into everybody in your Sunday school and especially your staff. You put it in there. You transfer dreams and ideas to your staff. That's what staff meetings are for. When we have staff meetings, when I have my pastor's leadership uh, care group, what, what am I doing? I'm transferring my dreams and my ideas and what I want this church to be into them. That's the whole idea. And that's why we have one on Sunday evening before church. We have one on Monday night. And we have one on Tuesday morning. They're all the same, but so people at their convenience can come. And that, that transfer is made. You feel it going into them. And you see it happening. And you see them moving into that area. But remember this now, and this is important in what I've just said. Be sp specific. Know where you are going as a Sunday school. Benjamin Franklin said, living without a goal is like shooting without a target. And that's true. Your staff needs to know where the Sunday school is headed. And they dream with you. They dream together. Now, there are three strengths in these goals of Sunday school. Three strengths. If you have these three strengths as overall goals of your Sunday school, something great is going to happen. Number one, now these are the strengths. Sunday school gives direction, and you need to know that in your goal. We've got a hold of something great and powerful and mighty in our church. It's giving direction. The Word of God and the dedicated teacher give direction to the student. This is what happens. Children, young youth and adults gain self-worth in here. Direction is there. You heard that talked about today, Brother Hyde. See, this, it's vital that this be put in to your organization. Oh, you can have the best uh, organization in the world, everything just organized to a T, but you've got to have some spirit in that organization. And one of the greatest spirits is dreaming, vision. That's what goals are. Is that, that's vision. Know where you are going, okay? Two, this is second strength under there. This is not step two. Sunday school is dynamically influential. All of our church staff, I, I was, uh, I, I, I went over this the other day and I was thinking about coming over here and everyone on our church staff, bless you, hallelujah, <laughs> I guess they said, was that a sneeze? <laughs> it was something anyway, it wasn't, but every one of them had grown up in Sunday school, 
And that Sunday school, they had felt its influence. They had felt its teaching. They had felt its positive direction. They felt its pulsating love. And so today, they're every one of them in a dedicated ministry of the Lord that grew up in Sunday school. Well, we, we and, and I, know, I know that you know that, but we want to re-emphasize that. You see, those kids grow up into men and women. Not only do, uh, it's, it's wonderful that those kids on Saturday morning are, they're winning the parents, but if the Lord tarries, those kids are going to grow up. Our bus director first came to our church on a bus as a kid. Isn't that great? Now, as a teenager, he got away. When he was about middle 20, when he was about uh, mid-20s, he got hungry for God. You know where he came? He came to the church of his youth and loved him and brought him to Sunday school. That's beautiful. Today, he's married, sits on the front row with his wife, and... Uh, shouts the victory and is over our buses. I, he talked to me Wednesday before church and he feels a call in the ministry now. That's beautiful. Hallelujah. Started on a bus. But uh, these kids grow up that you're teaching and they become great, wonderful people in your church. That's why, it's, listen, it's important that your church, your Sunday school be so organized and have the spirit of great growth and organization within it so that it can affect those kids that when they grow up, they will become stalwart members of your church or somebody's church. That's right. And that, that's what we've got to do. This is part of it. They're, the Sunday school is so influential. Number three, the Sunday school is soul winning as well. It's reaching. Sunday school is reaching, soul winning bus ministry, car ministry. Sunday school provides a place for the telephone ministry, host and hostess ministry, follow-up visitor visitation ministry. See, these are ministries that can be put into your Sunday school if you don't have it. Maybe you have a bus ministry. If you don't have buses, you can have a car ministry. You can have a telephone ministry. We have people, that's what they do is telephone. We have even letter writing people that they meet and now, I, every, every visitor walks through the doors of our church gets a letter from me. But it's a nice type, type page, you know. And, and uh, now, a lot of people don't expect that. And they tell me, well, I'm well, sure glad to hear from you. But I'm going to tell you who they don't expect to hear from is Sally Jones that they never heard of that wrote in her own handwriting and addressed the letter herself and it doesn't have the church uh, uh, postage stamp on it. It has one she licked and put on there and says, we were so glad to have you. See, there's ministries of soul winning built into the Sunday school that you can have. Host and hostess ministry. You know, that's a, that's a nice way to say you can have women ushers. Hallelujah. That's right. You, you ought to. You ought to think about having, if you don't have hosts and hostesses, meeting people of a morning, you can have greeters on the parking lot out there showing people the way. It's very, very beautiful. And then your follow-up. I ought to have all of this built into this. You need to have a follow-up visitor visitation. These telephone calls can, can be made to your absentees. And uh, there's so much. Okay. Step number two, there should be a proper Sunday school attitude, and that attitude is the winning attitude. This is one of the highest aims a Sunday school can have. You've got to be a believer in yourself and what you're doing. You've got, it's all of this, you say, well, I... I uh, you, you may have been looking for a little something different here in this particular class, and I was going to show you graphs and this type of thing. You can buy books and it has all of that in it. But I'm going to tell you what you've got to organize into your church. If it's going to be a great Sunday school, you've got to organize the spirit of this thing. You've got to organize a winning attitude that you're excited about it. Believe that God is working for you. 
You've got to believe it. I remember a preacher that was devastated by something that happened in his life. He was one of our best preachers. And I asked him to come preach a revival for me during this time. I knew he was down. He needed some help, encouragement. I'd help nurture him when he was a little younger. And uh, so he came. But he felt so insecure in this failure, or so-called failure, rejection really, was what it was in his life. That he couldn't give up, he, he could not believe that God would bless his preaching enough for people to come to God. He could not give an altar call. I said, you preach, I'll give the altar call. Then when you feel enough faith to start believing, then you just don't give it to me at the end. You, you do it. The first week, people came every night. And there were people getting the Holy Ghost and getting baptized. I was giving the altar call. He was preaching great. I was giving the altar call. And then the next week, something happened. He didn't turn it to me. Some, uh, he was building. Something was happening. So you've got to build a winning attitude into your staff. You got to build that in there. Believe that God's going to do something for you in everything you do. Praying for the sick in your class. They ought to pray for the sick in their class. They ought to pray for those kids. They can give all their calls in their class. They ought to teach them this. We don't have to just teach lessons by saying this is the way it's going to be and you've got to break out uh, all of the the paraphernalia that you use and all of that's good and it, and it ought to be used and I think that it's wonderful but it, it doesn't always have to be that way you can teach by what you do in praying for the sick and, and laying hands upon them and laying hands on them to receive the Holy Ghost remember this someone said one pessimist and if you are God help you today to get a hold of some faith one pessimist can pull four optimists down much quicker than four optimists can pull one pessimist up. And this is the reason why you've got to stay on top of things. If you're a leader, you need to stay on top of things and keep people up. Because one of them get down, they can pull four more down. And it's going to take you a while to get them back up again. It's better just stay up all the time. Hallelujah. God can make you up all of the time that's right God can give you a winning attitude you ever hear of Douglas Vowles Douglas Vowles is paralyzed from the neck down he cannot use his hands he can, he, he can use his vocal cords he can talk use his mouth this type of thing do you know what he is he's a telephone salesman that's right he he uses a computer got it rigged where he can with uh, an instrument in his between his teeth punch keys do things this is what he does and so he is a salesman now uh, let me tell you though there's something better about this Douglas uses this expertise to call the sick and the shut-ins of his church and cheer them up <laughs> Hey, are you down? After, after that story, no one should ever be down again. He has a winning attitude. It's all because he has that attitude. The oldest person I ever pastored was 99 years of age. She was one of the most winning people in our church. She helped me so much. It's no wonder that that her daughter went to the mission field. It is no wonder that she had several grandchildren in the ministry. It is no wonder because she had such a winning attitude right up until about three months before her death. She was still sharp and doing all of that. If she can do it at 99, you and I, ought, a young guy like me, ought to be able to do it. That's right. And I, I was a kid in her sight. That's for sure. Step number three. You know what that step number three is? You need to build some excitement in your staff. Because excited people will bring excitement to
to the whole area. Everybody has the same capacity for excitement. There's a lot of good Sunday schools that are well organized, but they're not growing Sunday schools, and, and they're not doing much because there's no excitement there. You got to get excited about things. You, you, you gotta, you, 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 you've got to move in this area. We need to organize in such a way, and this is the way you can be excited, organize in such a way you can be proud of what you're doing. Proud of what you're doing. I'm proud of our church. I'm proud of our people. I'm proud of what we're doing. I can tell anybody in our city, I, I don't care if it's a mayor or whoever he may be, you ought to come to our church. And hey, he's been there several times. And uh, that I'm proud of it. I tell our people, listen, we want to do things so good that we, we don't care who comes. We know it's going to bless them some way. That doesn't mean you have to be big to do that. I'm talking about that you are putting things together in your Sunday school that you can be proud of it. And when you're proud of it, you can be excited about it. Hallelujah. There's nothing wrong with saying hallelujah. That's right. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with saying, I love my Sunday school. I love my class. Sometimes there's a lady who used to be in our church before I took it 22 and a half years ago. She is in a very wonderful church about 25 miles away. In fact, my wife and I preached there or spoke there. Uh, my wife's not a preacher, but we spoke at a, at a young married retreat there just for Easter. And, uh, but she almost irritates me sometimes. I mean, her church is so far superior to mine. Her, everything they're doing is so great. Oh, I mean, she, she will. Then I have a son. I have a son that pastors on the East Coast. I can't get a word in edgewise when I talk to him on the phone because he's always telling me what wonderful things they're doing. He won't stop listening to the wonderful things we're doing. But don't you like that kind of spirit? And see, what you do is build a class full of that, a staff full of that kind of spirit. Now, this is what you are. You talk about organizing. You've got to organize this into it. You've got to program this into your staff and into your Sunday school. If it gets into your staff, it'll get into the students of that staff. That's right. It'll do it. And you've got to organize that. You say, well, I, I never heard of this being org. Oh, my friend, you're missing it 10 million miles. Excitement, enthusiasm. And then what you do, you're, you're transmitting this to your family, and you're transmitting this to your friends, other church members, and other members of the Sunday school staff everywhere you go. I try to put it into every one of our superintendents and every one of our leaders, whatever area that they're in in the church, that what they're doing is the most important thing in the world to them. And they ought to be the proudest of it. And they ought to be the greatest advocate and the PR person for that. You want a big choir? Get the choir members recruiting and talking about how wonderful it is. That's right. They may sing pretty. But they've got to be enthused for it to really come into the congregation and the Sunday school the same way. See what I'm talking about? Doesn't that make you want to know what in the world they're doing over there? Let's do it. Raw, raw, raw for Sunday school. Let's say it, okay? Raw, raw, raw Sunday school. Hey! There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Give yourself a pe pep talk every once in a while. I have to. I talk to myself. I say, look, Fred J., you got the wrong idea about this thing. Come on, straighten up. Get in there. Or if I'm down, kind of down the mullet grubs, come on. I'm not down in them too, too far, too often, too long. But that, that's the way. Uh, you see someone, someone asks you, how in the world are you doing? 
Well, think about the good side, the good things. And you're doing well in that. I was telling my wife the other day, I said, I was talking about a man and his wife. And I, I just visited with them. And they're really enthused about God, but they're not very enthused about their health. And man, I was trying to pump them up a little bit in there. And uh, the woman just getting over real bad surgery and she's doing good in it. But she's already got the arthritis down so bad. And, and so I, I almost left with the arthritis, really. Oh, Arthur, almost attacked me. Just, it will. It'll do it. So I got out of there in a hurry. I didn't want it to jump on me. I want to get out there where someone is saying, hey, I'm feeling good and I'm going to do something for God. You see? That's what we've got to do. So you build enthusiasm. An excited leader makes excited followers. My son, the same son I was talking about, uh, he uh, was uh, reading somewhere where someone said, if you really want to get a jump on the day is when the alarm clock goes off in the morning, jump up and shout at the world, I'm ready for you today. Hallelujah. Praise God. He forgot to tell his wife, though. <laughs> the alarm went off, and he jumped out of bed that first morning and hollered, Hallelujah, I'm ready for your world. I'm coming after you. And she opened one eye and said, Mark Foster, if you don't shut up, I'm coming after you. <laughs> what about our boy? She, he forgot about the little boy just on the other uh, uh, other wall in the next room that was sleeping at that you may not want to do it just like that but you ought to get a hold of something like that amen build it you got to organize it you got to program it if anything like this if you have a winning attitude friend you, you program it you got to read the scripture read the scripture Read that that will strengthen you and help you and give you a winning attitude. If you have goals and you know where you're going, you've got to set those goals. You've got to do it. Praise God. There's just something very beautiful about it. Come on in, gentlemen. We're, we're competing one with the other over here. Everybody say praise the Lord. Let them know we're over here. Okay. One other thing that we need to develop into this is perseverance. Perseverance. I think this kills more Sunday schools than anything else, is to get something started and then let it go. If you're going to start something, you're going to do it, you need to finish it. One thing my old dad said when about farming, he said, boys, farm every inch of ground. Get as close to the fence line as you can when you're plowing. That's what you need to do. You need to plow every inch. You need to use every inch of it. You need to continue exertion. You need to be a finisher. You need to see it through in every way. Perseverance is what I'm talking about. And uh, remember this. See, you can, you can do all kinds of organizing or use plans. And someone said this, plans get you into things, but you have to work your way out. Did you ever wonder why you ever got yourself in what you're doing? Yeah? You feel all this big burden about something, and you get people, other people enthused about it, and you're going with it, and you're doing it, and down about a month from then, you wonder why you ever got into it, because it's a big job. It's a big job. And the only way you're going to get out is to work your way out. So, if you are going to have a well-organized Sunday school that is effective and is doing the job that it needs to do, you must be willing to see it through and work it every day. You've got to work it all the time. Work it all the time. Work it all the time. The reason why the choir can sing so beautiful every Sunday night is somebody's practicing They've got to practice. I compliment our choir once in a while before the whole church. These people come on a Thursday night. They come back after we get out of church at 12 on Sunday morning. They're back here, some at 4 o'clock, some at 4.30, to practice before we begin our service that night. 
And that, that, that takes a, that's a price to pay. But it's, that it's all the time. All, some of them have been doing it for 30 years. That's right. They're, just, they're still at it. And the reason they're doing it so good is because they're working at it. You've got to do the same thing with your Sunday school class and with your whole Sunday school. You've got to keep working it. And that's why it's important to have these planning sessions. Planning sessions. That constant. But not just planning. Now, some churches have made the mistake of... that. It's, it's a good thing to start the planning session. But I think that the mistake is, is to not have prayer and burden and a spiritual meeting connected with the planning session. Planning session can get dull. That can be dull. You say, why don't, why don't you just tell us on the telephone? You can tell me what to do on the telephone. But you can't pray together as effectively on the telephone. You get the whole staff in there together, the staff of your class, or the staff of the department, or the whole, if you're a smaller church, get the whole staff in there. And you get them praying together. Pray for the students that they're going to teach. Pray for the class. Pray for the bus ministry out there working right now and bringing some kids. They're on their way with a bus full of kids praying for them. Then take a few moments to plan for the next, next Sunday, putting it together right then. Also, what that does for the superintendent, it makes them plan far enough ahead that they're not throwing some stuff together on a Saturday night. And you are being well organized in doing that. But when you put the burden and the planning together, and you put prayer together with it, there's something very beautiful to it. So remember, plans get you into things, but you have to work your way out. And someone said the elevator to success is out of order. You can't catch it, I'm sorry. You're going to have to take the stairs one step at a time. I'm sorry, there are no easy ways to success in Sunday school. You've got to build it. You have to build it just like you build a house. There's hard work and there's sweat in it. If you're going to remodel your house, you're going to repaint the kitchen, there's work in it. It's in your dream. You're going to have to work it. It's not going to happen by magic. It's not, the snap of the finger is not going to do it, and so it is with a great Sunday school. But if you will develop perseverance, that fourth step into your Sunday school staff, that they're going to see it through, that they're going to be finishers, that they're going to have continued exertion and teach them that there are few overnight success stories, only a few. If they go to the bottom of whatever it may be, they'll find years of work. I'm sure you've probably heard the story of the V8 engine. Henry Ford got it in his mind, untrained mind. He was, one, he was a wizard when it came to mechanics. He was not, he had very few years of education, but he get things in his mind. And so he got the idea that a powerful engine could be built for his automobiles if they had a V8 type. And so he went to his engineers and he told them, he said, I believe that we can build a V8. And they said, it can't be done. It will never work harmoniously. It's going to tear the whole thing up. And he said, go to work on it. They came back within a month. They said, Mr. Ford, it cannot be done. And he said, keep working. He's paying them, so they kept working. They came back three months. They said, Mr. Ford, it is an impossibility to build a V8 engine. He said, I believe that it can be built. Keep working. They came back six months later. And they said, no. It can't be. We have tried everything imaginable, and it will not and cannot be done. He said, keep working. They kept working. Over a year, they worked on that thing, and finally, they hit on all the right ingredients that was in his mind that he knew would work, 
All of that came together. All the work they had done over these months of failures came together and it became one of the greatest engines put in an automobile because of the perseverance and persistence and the follow through and the finishing idea of an uneducated man that became one of the wealthiest men in this country because he believed in an idea and was willing to pay the price to see it done. And so it is with our Sunday schools. If you will set goals and build them into your Sunday school, if you will program a winning attitude into your staff that you are big enough to do it, I like the Caleb spirit. Give me this mountain, he said. It doesn't matter how impossible it may look for your class or for your Sunday school uh, as a whole. There's nothing that's impossible. If you begin work today and you begin dreaming and you begin believing, it will come to pass. It can if you'll work at it. If you'll work at it. Yes, sir. Your enthusiasm will inspire other people. And that's what you want to do. You want to inspire your leaders. If this fellow was my Sunday school coordinator,